You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Dr. Freehill, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. It's been a while, but I'm, I'm glad we finally have a chance to sit down and, and talk some orthopedics. So welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and, and typically at the beginning of our episodes, we ask a couple of questions just getting to know our guests before we transition into the topic of the day. So, you know, first question I have for you, just a general question is, do you have any interest outside of the field of orthopedics? You know, we all love orthopedics a lot, but do you have anything else that you like to do? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, obviously, being in the Bay Area now, there's a lot of uh, great things to do around here. My kids are of the age where uh, most of my free time revolves around their activities. Uh, so, you know, a lot of uh, their sports and travel sports and activities around school. And then, um, you know, obviously when, when there's a chance to, we like to travel. I like to travel. Um, so, you know, those are, those are the things I enjoy uh, to do. I'm sure as my kids get older, there'll be more time to uh, get into some other hobbies. But that's where I am at this point in life. Yeah, I like, I like traveling, traveling uh, as well. Obviously, you know, due to COVID, it hasn't been as much travel and also due to residency. But I like to travel too. Um, other question I have for you. And this is a question we've been asking more recently, and I've been interested to hear everybody's different responses, but do you have a book that you have gifted to others? You know, this could be an orthopedic book. It could be a non-orthopedic book, a book about anything, but any books that you have gifted to others? Yeah, I know. I think that's a great question. So I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, I actually, I think giving books is a great gift. So, you know, for my physician assistant, Kevin, you know, for the holidays, I, I gave him the, the new uh, mats and shoulder, the sixth edition, the one that just came out. Um, you know, I had a chapter in there, which was kind of nice to be involved in that and a great honor. But I gave him that book, uh, which is, you know, kind of the totality of, of shoulder. Um, and then I have given a book. Uh, I gave a book to all the baseball, Stanford baseball staff that I work with. Um, and there were some different ones. So, you know, for the pitching coach, I, I gave, and for my, uh, baseball, uh, science core at Stanford, uh, director, I gave them the arm by Jeff Passan. I don't know if you've heard that book, but no, I haven't. It's, you know, really fantastic for the hitting coaches. Um, I gave a book called swing Kings by a guy named Jared diamond which is very cool because that's kind of the revolution of uh, kind of the new revolution of hitting a lot of the big leaguers, JD Martinez and Justin Turner. A lot of these guys are, have, have caught in wave. And it's interesting because it goes back to, you know, a lot of Ted Williams, who was obviously a great hitters belief in, in the uh, angle of your swing or a launch angle, if you will. And, and it, I, th I find it fascinating, you know, because these are people that we know and, a lot of that revolution came around the, around the Bay area. So it's, it's pretty mm. cool. So, um, yeah, those are the last one. And then for the head coach, um, for Stanford baseball coach Esker, I gave him a book that came out, uh, just recent, well, about a year ago called cheated. And that was talking about the, uh, the Houston Astros scandal, you know, the, with the bang in the garbage cans and, you know, winning the world really? Series and potentially cheating. So, you know, everybody likes oh. those books. I think it's exciting when you get a book, you know, especially a hardback book from somebody. I think that that it's a nice gift to give. So it's a it's a great question that you have. And I enjoy <laughs> talking about it. Yeah, a lot of people aren't um, used. I still enjoy a good old, you know, book that's in your hands that you can, you know, feel and has weight. You know, <laughs> I mean, a lot of it goes as, as digital these days. But I, I, I appreciate a, a yeah, good, too. you know, hardcover book. And, you know, last question I have for you is, kind of what brought you towards, you know, this, this field of academics and, and where you're at now and, you know, in your career? Yeah, you know, it's a, it, I had an interesting route. Um, you know, I'll just fast forward myself I'm from Arizona originally, but I'll just fast forward myself into undergraduate. I went to a private Catholic school called University of San Diego, which is a great school in the, in the West Coast Conference. And I 
played baseball there and I was really focused on um, going to medical school and I put most of my efforts towards that and I went there as an infielder and quickly realized that um, I, you know, I don't know if it was staying up all night studying or if I was just wasn't as good of a hitter as I thought I was or as they, or they thought I was. So I, I fortuitously got converted to a pitcher, which, mm. uh, which was interesting because I always had a really good arm and they said, Hey, look, come down to, you know, practice really quick, you know, do your throwing, do your running and then go to lab. You know, you don't, you don't need to be here all the time uh, as a pitcher with regards to practice. So um, that worked out pretty well. And I, you know, did, did, did very well. And then before my senior year, I did really uh, good in a, in a wood bat, one of these, you know, college type leagues. Um, and, and that garnered a lot of attention. I went back and pitched my senior season and, and it was successful enough that, you know, by, by April of my senior year in college, I had a number of teams that were calling me and asking about um, whether whether I would sign if a pro contract if I was drafted, which I was like, wow. I mean, is this is this uh, of course <laughs> who wouldn't right? Even of course, <laughs> year just to say that you played professional baseball, um, you know, and a lot. A lot it's interesting because a couple of the teams said, we're going to draft you pretty high. You know, will you sign other teams said, well, you're a senior, um, you know, you haven't really pitched that much. We know you're going to go to medical school, but you know, you, you know, you'd be worth a late round flyer, but nonetheless, I was like, if I get drafted, I'm signing. And I pretty much knew <laughs> I was going to. So I, that ended up happening, you know, within a week I graduate from college and then I get drafted by the California angels. They were the California angels back then. And, uh, and then st sent on that journey, you know, and I went thinking I was going to play for one season and I did pretty well. So I said, Oh, well, you know, I, you know, I'm going to try this another season and, and did really well. And then the next thing I know I'm in winter ball. And the next thing I know I'm at a ma at major league spring training. So I, you know, I moved very quickly uh, through the minor leagues and started having success. So this started to put, uh, medical school on the back burner uh, for a time. And um, interestingly, I, even though I reached a relatively high level fast, um, you know, one level below the major leagues and on the 40 man roster, I started having a lot of shoulder pain. And, you know, it's interesting knowing what I know now about throwers uh, back then, even though, you know, we, we still had great team physicians and stuff. I mean, the conversations that were going on and what, what we knew about the thrower's shoulder then, I can tell you is a, is a whole different ball of wax now. And, um, you know, another part of the issue, and this might come up in some of our thrower shoulder talk is, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago, even when I was playing, if you were considered a prospect, you know, they wanted you to keep playing and that might make sense uh, all year round. And that, that makes a little bit of sense for hitters and position players. But as pitchers, you know, it's a one – being a, a pitcher, it's the one unique position to me in sports that you really do need to shut down, uh, probably throwing for three months of the year. People will argue that, but um, I think that that's, that's true. Now, that doesn't mean that you're shutting down working out. That doesn't mean you're shutting down building your body. Um and doing all those types of things, but the, but actually letting your arm recover a bit. And I, you know, when I was doing it, once I got on onto that prospect type of uh, highway, um, you know, it was about three consecutive years where, you know, I would be, you know, going to spring training early in February with the major league camp and then pitching the whole season and then going to a winter ball and, and getting home in about January and having to, get ready to go to spring training again in February. And that, you know, that, that's a lot. Um, and the, um, the amount of throwing you do in pro ball is, uh, is significant. So, um, so I ended up having, sh you know, shoulder, a shoulder injury, uh, which was, you know, looking back now, it's just where ge general wear and tear. I had a really loose kind of capsule, 
Uh, our team doctor for the Angels was uh, Lewis Yoakum or Lou Yoakum. Uh, I'm sure many people that may listen to this podcast will know who he is. He was one of the great baseball doctors. He's passed on since then, but he was a tremendous mentor uh, for me in the transition from you know pro baseball to to medical school and and you know doing doing what I do now. And you know it's interesting when I got drafted by the Angels, you we went to Arizona for all the guys that got drafted and you get your musculoskeletal physical exam and, you know, he's examining me and I'm like, Oh, this is so great. You know, I think I'd like to do what you're doing one day. And he's looks at me like, are you, are you crazy? <laughs> you're you're, you're, you're right. probably a dumb baseball player. But you know, Every time I would see him every year, he finally caught on. He's like, Oh, it's great. You know, if you go back and um, you know, so he ended up becoming a mentor of mine, but, um, the procedure that I had done, uh, you've probably heard about, it's not really so much done anymore, certainly not in throwers, was a thermal capsulography. Yes, heard of it. Uh, so you know, when you go back into the 90s, mid 90s and late 90s, you know, that was what they were doing for a lot of these, these uh, a lot of the pitchers that were having, you know, that had a loose, loose uh, capsule. You know, and that got into, you know, what's er early and this changed a little bit in 2003 when uh, when, you know, Morgan and Kibler and they they came out with their uh, with their GERD uh, in scapular dyskinesia stuff. But the GERD stuff, you know, before that, most of the the loose shoulder and the pathologic shoulder was coming out of Curl and Job. And that was that you had. Uh, you built up a lot of laxity anteriorly. And that was what they thought was the problem. Um, you know, so the thermal shrink would be, you're not doing necessarily putting sutures in or to over tightening you back to the glenoid, but they would actually just, you know, take the, the, you know, radio frequency wand and, and with high heat and stripe, stripe it basically like, shrinking some bacon you know right, right. And, you know you can tell it's not really an exact science and you know not a lot of people it did very well with that procedure especially high level throwers i mean you know you could get back and i did get back uh, it was never the same you know the when you start talking about velocity and more important than velocity, like electricity of your pitches, you know, there's a difference between just throwing hard and having something electric at the end of it and the way it moves and the way it can move late. And that, that's what kind of differentiates, I think, people at high levels of pitching versus the masses, so to speak. And I kind of lost that and the ability to bounce back. I noticed that was very difficult. If it did feel good one day, Normally I could come back and pitch the next day and then it, it didn't come back. So um, anyway, I, you know, end up having a difficult time getting back and it was released by the angels and mm -hmm. had gotten high enough that I was still in demand and kind of wanted to put closure on this. Uh, so I ended up signing with Texas Rangers and uh, was in their system for about a year and a half, but it, it you know, it worked real, it worked out really great because my MCAT had expired. Um, so I had uh, the summer before the last season I played, I, you know, went home to Arizona and I would, you know, get up and study MCAT all day. And then I would go do my workouts and go do my throwing and uh, study MCAT some more. And it sounds kind of crazy, but I hadn't had physics in like eight years at that point. <laughs> yeah. No, I know what that means. I mean. So, um, so then I went back to spring training and said, this is going to be it. And, you know, started at double A and went up to triple A Oklahoma City. And I thought this is perfect, you know, because I'm one level below the major leagues. And I, you know, I could tell, uh, you know, pitching, you know, my arm didn't feel that good. It hurt constantly. I didn't, well, I didn't think I had very good stuff, not, not certainly not good enough stuff to get major league hitters out. So it was a perfect, uh, you know, running that course. And I look back as frustrating as it was to get so close and then get injured i think that you know which is a nice segue into this topic is you know having i think maybe it was a you know better uh divine intervention uh 
than just getting maybe getting to the big leagues for a few years or having a short career in the big leagues was to, to have happen what happened to me. And that was getting injured, trying to rehab it, having a surgery, coming back, having those trials and tribulations of the ups and the downs and the psychologic warfare that goes on. And, um, you know, just the differences that you feel, I think it allows me to take better care of, of, uh, of, of players I take care of. So to make a long story short, I knew I was going to go back to med school and I did that and went to, uh, as your introduction said, went to Tulane and ended up at Hopkins for residency. I wanted to be a team doctor and do anything around the shoulder uh, as well as take care of throwers, athletes, elbows. So I needed, to, I felt I needed to do, to do two fellowships and I uh, did the sports uh, orthopedic fellowship at Stanford and then went back to to Harvard with JP Warner, uh, for a year. Um, and then, uh, then I I was finally on my way and, and bounced around and, um, you know, finally ended up getting recruited back to Stanford and, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting, you know, helping out with the A's have Stanford baseball. And most importantly was, uh, was building up the, you know, the Dr. Maloney, the chair here, part of the recruitment was that, start a Stanford pitching lab. And I, have you know, was able to hire somebody and had a lot of applicants to, to, to run or basically direct, be the lead sports scientist. And I had a lot of people who were interested in doing and having that position, which I think would just be so exciting and ended up getting a, a gentleman by the name of Bryson Nakamura, uh, who, who's, uh, was the head performance, uh, PhD biomechanist from the Milwaukee Brewers and uh, is just, I, you know, I know a lot about baseball, but talking to him, it's just unbelievable. His baseball mind is unbelievable. So he's kind of running the show here and I'm so lucky. And that's, uh, that's where I am. That's what's going on now. So it's exciting times. Yeah. And that's that's awesome. My mind from a pitching lab to more of a comprehensive, you know, we're, it's called the Stanford baseball science core. So we're looking at everything from pitchers to hitters, different age groups, performance, injury prevention. Uh, and we you know, really want to build it out to be a t- destination type of place. Right. No, that's awesome. I mean, that's a lot to go through a lot of, um, you know, trials and tribulations, especially getting injured and, you know, having these having this done to you and then end up, you know, going to med school, doing a couple of fellowships and. I mean, that's a that's an awesome story. And I think it's a great transition into what we're talking about today, which is a thrower's shoulder. And I know you had an injury uh, to your shoulder, but in throwers, how how common are, are shoulder injuries? You know, like what it just kind of gives us a little bit of background on a thrower's shoulder that is. And then we can kind of move forward and talk about some of the different changes that are seen in the thrower's shoulder. Yeah. So, you know, I think that. Well, to answer your question, I mean, they're very common, especially with the, the younger throwers. I think at the higher levels with like the, the pros and, and probably even the elite collegiate uh, players, I think they're becoming, uh, they're less than they probably were just because, as I was saying about the, the understanding now about the kinetic chain and the importance of the lower extremities and the importance of the hip strength and the core strength and what, how to strengthen the scapula stabilizers and the importance of, you know, keeping your internal rotation motion, you know, appropriate and just basically how to condition uh, better. So I think that a lot of those shoulder at the higher levels is better understood. So we don't see quite as much, but when you start talking about the younger kids um, and the high school kids, they don't, have access or knowledge of that so i think it's it's uh it's more common than you think um in those age groups right and 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 so what are because i you know reading on this and actually helping write a chapter on this i had to do a lot of research into it and so we know that there's some adaptive changes into the into the shoulder just like you were just talking about we know a lot more about the shoulder now than we did maybe you know 15 20 years ago and so what are some of those like you know what are what what are some of those changes that are seen like almost, you know, exclusively in people that do a lot of throwing? Yeah. So, you know, this has been pretty well documented, but 
the different areas of importance or what we perceive as importance always changes. Uh, you know, we, we know that uh, there are going to be adaptations and these adaptations can be normal. And when I say that, what I mean is if you put your a thrower's arm at 90 degrees of abduction and measure them into external rotation, they should have greater external rotation on that throwing side than they do on the non-throwing shoulder. And they should have, they'll, they'll generally have a little less internal rotation on the throwing side than, than the non-throwing arm or shoulder. So you almost expect that. Now, that, again, this gets into the early stuff where we, you would measure the internal rotation on each side at 90 degrees of abduction. And when you started getting near a 20 degree difference, that would be what we would call GERD or G-I-R-D, glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. And that was, you know, very heavy focus was on that uh, probably, you know, 10 to 15 years ago. And, and we still look at that, of course, but not, it's not quite so polarizing um, as maybe looking at this in a different way. Maybe it's total arc of motion that's more important than just a deficit in internal rotation. So if you start to get uh, uh, a deficiency or less total arc of motion in that throwing shoulder, that could be the signal for trouble. And, you know, I'll tell you one, one area that kind of interests me, and I see this occasionally, you perform the external rotation at 90 degrees of abduction, you expect them in their throwing shoulder to move back into greater external rotation and they don't. And mm. sometimes these can be power pitchers and you think to yourself, gosh, this is a really strange finding. And I'm not so sure that, that that's not a problem. So, you know, it's interesting, Cody, as much as we learn, you know, we continue to learn more and more, you know, it just, there's still a lot to figure out. Right. Yeah. So one of the, again, just to kind of reiterate main things you were talking about was that, you know, sometimes they can have a relative decrease in internal rotation, but their total arc of motion, when you combine internal and external rotation may stay the same. And then if you have a loss of that, they could, that could be, could be problematic. And, and could you quickly touch base on the, the phases of throwing? I think that may be something important to understand. And then we can kind of go a little bit more into, you know, kind of the, how do we start to assess these people for motion loss? Yeah. And go back one slide. I, or yeah, go back one slide. Yeah, and there, I think yeah, you have a great um, point down there with the, the retroversion. This is an interesting point. And I, I should have said this, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting when you start talking about um, the, what goes on at the proximal physis in throwers. I think that if you don't throw a lot when you're skeletally immature, that you you almost by doing so you almost independently select yourself into being a thrower. Whereas, and what I mean by that is, if you don't throw when you're younger, that what you get is this derotation, meaning your move your your shoulder or this proximal humerus is moving into what happens to most and that it's, it derotates or almost becomes more antiverted. Right. But if you throw a lot, there's enough micro trauma, if you will, uh, across that physis that it doesn't derotate the same. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So I think that that's interesting and, um, and something to think about, you know, um, that's why me personally, even though Tom Noonan, uh, at Stedman Denver, who's taking care of the Rockies for years has done amazing research on the humoral retroversion as have other authors. Me personally, I think it's interesting. I think it's a good finding to report upon, but to me that bony contribution is, is you, you know, that happened early in life that doesn't happen later. Right. It is what it is. Whereas GERD or internal rotation deficit is a soft tissue phenomenon and that can be corrected. So, you know, I think that it, that 
that that that's an interesting at least in the way i think about throwers an interesting way to differentiate these different pathologies now uh, with yeah. regards to phases of throwing <laughs> you know it's it's these are the you know these are the great phases and you know dr andrews should get so you know you know much uh love for all the work that he's done in this uh space and just the breakthroughs and all the studies and we've gotten to now because of a lot of the great work that he pioneered or was part of pioneering I think that now, and we're working on, on something to do with this now is, you know, if I look at this original drawing, knowing, you know, these are the phases, but, you know, there are so many mechanical flaws in that, in those, in those figures. And, um, you know, I think it's time that we polish up the phases of throwing. Okay. Uh, because we do know a lot now. Now, with that being said, there Very are true. some key points. Uh, you know, a lot of times what you'll see with with uh, younger throwers and with throwers is that when you go from the wind up into the stride, a lot of times what you'll see, and you, not to say you can't see this in big leaguers, but if things get going too quick, they don't have that good balance point and they start to topple, meaning the upper torso or the upper body starts to fall down the mound faster uh, you know, gets out in front of the lower body. And if that occurs, you know, it's very hard for that arm that's demonstrated getting into late cocking. It's hard for that to get to late cocking uh, on time. And that means that you're coming down the mound and your upper body's coming down, your arms dragging, trying to get up into late cocking and then throw. And this is kind of the snowball effect that happens a lot. The other thing that within these phases that can, uh, that we know can cause some problems is when your hips uh, rotate too early or you almost swing that front leg too early. It can feel like you're, you know, gaining momentum or you're, or when you swing open, you're feeling like you're creating this velocity. But if you just think about it in your mind's eye, that again, that's leaving that arm uh, to really have to catch up and just, when, you know, when your body's going forward, you can think about, what's going on at your, your uh, elbow and, and what's going on at your shoulder. So you really want to take advantage. I think the important thing with the phases of throwing are you have these different, as Ben Kibler likes to call them, nodes, if you will, uh, that he described with tennis players. But you want to make sure that you hit certain points, hitting the balance point, making sure your stride foot is going out with your torso still behind it, <clears throat> making sure that your arm's getting up into external rotation, prior to you know your hips totally opening up too early you know and then obviously getting a good follow through you know, i don't i don't love the the front it's hard to tell here when the ball's coming out of the hand <laughs> i think another big point is that and and you see this happen with throwers sometimes is when that front when that back foot is coming up off the mound before they've released the ball i think that you've lost it'd be like if you threw a punch at someone and you're driving off your back leg versus your back leg is up, you know, you can, if you hit a punching bag, you could tell probably the difference in the force that you could strike that with, you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. That, that happens in the shoulder and as well in throwing. So, so when we're Dr. Frio, when we're looking at these, you know, these patients that, you know, that, that are throwers and they're just saying that they have a, a loss of velocity, can you, and I know there are many different, you know, papers out there about kind of some of the pathophysiology behind motion loss, but can you kind of take us through what is happening like in the shoulder or so, you know, some can be outside of the shoulder as well. If you talk about the kinetic chain, but what is happening, um, you know, when, when these players are getting this, this loss of their motion? Yeah. Well, you know, depending on where the, depending on where the, motion loss is if you think about let's just say losing internal rotation uh, at 90 degrees of, of abduction um, what's happening is if you think about throwing again and again and again and again you know the uh, we know that throwing a 
the throwing motion or throwing a baseball is the fastest human motion ever recorded. Yeah, you, know, you didn't, and it's quick as you're getting that arc of motion, and bam, that's going forward. You know, your arm would probably, you know, be shot like a missile off your body if something wasn't slowing it down, and that's your your posterior rotator cuff and your posterior capsule, right? Your posterior shoulders is what's slowing it down. So it makes a lot of sense that um, the posterior inferior glenohumeral ligament is what over time with this, you know, micro trauma of throwing again and again and again and again can start to hypertrophy or get thick. And that is what causes you to lose some of that internal rotation at 90 degrees of abduction. Now you take that one step further and say, okay, well, that's, that's a great finding. Why does that matter? Right. And I think that, that what's important about that is there was an article in JBJS years ago um, by Grossman et al. And they noted that if you had a tight posterior inferior capsule that versus not being not tight or being normal, that the migration in this position of late cocking, or let's say, you know, when you get your arm up into 90 degrees of abduction, you're getting back to in the throwing position, you're always going to have a little bit of posterior superior migration of the humeral head on that glenoid. But if you have a tight posterior capsule or GERD, if you will, that that's accentuated, meaning that it's even more of a drastic uh, move or translation of the humeral head into the posterior superior aspect of the shoulder. Why does that matter? Because of this slide, um, that is going to exacerbate internal impingement and internal impingement as Jill's Walsh, which a lot of people don't realize was in 1992 is the original, uh, you know, description of, of this internal impingement phenomenon in tennis players. Um, and that's when you get into that late cocking position and the humeral head will move up into that posterior superior position. And you have the under surface of the anterior based infraspinatus getting pinched in there with the posterior superior labrum and you know the humeral head and the glenoid it's all kind of grinding together and that you know that that's a a normal type of phenomenon um but you know it makes sense if we know that you get this um internal rotation deficit in your hyper uh, accentuating that, that you're going to get even more friction and more contact and more potential problems with the undersurface of the rotator cuff, as well as the superior labrum. And that, and that's, and we know that, and that's been published uh, on numerous occasions. And obviously I think that with the, uh, the Burkhardt Morgan Kibler publications that, that really started to come to more light. So, so just to recap, so when we talk about the uh, internal impingement, we're talking about, you know, how over time, especially when you're trying to slow the ball down during um, uh, after you've let, let the ball go, you start to have that posterior inferior um, glenohumeral um, contracture, which, you know, gets a, you have a posterior capsule contracture. And then as they're in that kind of late cocking phase, you start to get migration of the humeral head posteriorly and superiorly and with that you also get the what we call the internal impingement uh, between the posterior superior cuff and labrum in between the uh the the humerus and the glenoid and then this kind of whole term is the internal impingement and and reading on that i see the internal impingement but i also read and you see about scapular dyskinesis what what I guess what part or what, what role does that play in, in motion loss? Yeah. And, and just one more point on that it was a great recap is just remember like Walsh's publication. So, you know, what internal impingement is, but much like a lot of things around the joint, you have physiologic internal impingement. Basically we expect there to be some contact up there, but when you get that thickened, posterior inferior glenohumeral ligament causing the rotation deficit, that's when you get the potential uh, pathologic okay. internal uh, impingement. 
Yes, and I, and uh, so that's that's the point there. And then that's also, you know, why it's so important to educate because certain uh, maneuvers or stretches, such as a sleeper stretch or a cross body adduction stretch, both of those uh, learned by young throwers early on and becoming part of their routine can combat uh the development of the internal rotation deficit does that make sense so this is a perfect sense tension strategy you can avoid it yeah makes perfect sense so with regards, it, yeah go ahead Sorry. no that's what i was going to ask you about um the scapular kind of the the role that the scapula and scapular dyskinesis plays in motion loss in the shoulder right so you know, I think that in my mind, when you think about the scapula, we know from that early publication of the Morgan Kibler Burkhardt that from arthroscopy that, you know, I, th I, I believe the picture is the posterior thorax uh, of, uh, of Kurt Schilling, who many know is a, a great pitcher, uh, likely Hall of Famer, maybe Hall of Famer someday, but, mm -hmm. and you see the uh, uneven uh, scapular position. And it's a little bit uh, more inferior on the throwing shoulder. And, and I think that for those who look at a lot of throwers uh, and look at their backs, you can see that that's not so abnormal. But what is, a, what is not good or what is abnormal is if they have repeated motion and I like to have them do repeated forward flexion. And if you start to see that throwing arm scapula bouncing around a bit more, it's becoming more accentuated on the posterior thorax. They're saying that it gets fatigue, uh, that that's when you start to realize that the scapular stabilizers, um, that being, you know, trapezius, levator, rhomboid, major and minor and, and serratus, that you could have some imbalance or some weakness with those. And that can be causing this, uh, this imbalance that again, could be causing problems at the shoulder and, and then even traveling distally into the arm. When you talk about what's going on at the shoulder because of that, if you think about the scapular stabilizers becoming weak, what do you need when you throw a uh, baseball? You need those muscles to be able to pull that scapula back into a very retracted position. Because if you don't get the scapula into that retracted position, you don't get that acromion pulling back. When you get that arm into that hyper abducted externally rotated position, um, you're gonna, you could ex externally impinge, correct? So, so you're saying it's this protracted. So if you're saying if you have scapular protraction and you get into the abducted, externally rotated you can impinge in that sense not when it's retracted yes and the okay. impingement is different right because that could okay. be external impingement right because you're impinging on the undersurface of your acromion oh, okay and i'm sure it could cause some alteration and people smarter than me probably probably have said this i'm sure you get some alteration in internal impingement as well but you want retraction of the scapula when you throw. And by having scapular dyskinesia, secondary to fatigue of the scapular stabilizers, you are in a more protracted position and thus you're having pain probably because you can't clear appropriately up there. You're causing some compensation or potential small changes in your mechanics, which can be causing trouble. The other physical exam maneuver you use here is, you know, you, you're touching the medial, palpating the medial side of the coracoid uh, on both shoulders, but on the throwing arm, you're seeing, does that cause pain? And a lot of times they will say, yes, that, that really hurts. And that's because if you think about the protracted scapula, the pectoralis minor attaches to the medial border of the coracoid. And if the scapula is protracted, that's going to put that pec minor in a more you know, it'd be like not bending your elbow for a while. Then you finally bend it, you know, it's very tight. It's putting that in that, in a more tension type of mm. contracted position. 
which is why, and you see that because it's protracted, and that's why when you build those scapular stabilizers up and really get back to retracting your scapula or pinching your shoulder blades together, so to speak, um, that stretches out that pec minor. That's that, and that, and that discomfort goes away. So it's it's interesting how this all interacts, so to speak. Yeah, no, that that makes that makes perfect sense. The reason why, I th- why you know think of, uh, if the physical exam, if you're uh, palpating the coracoid, obviously you know you have your conjoint tendon there, and immediately some will say that if they have pain and tenderness, that may uh, clue you in towards a um, uh, to uh, probably something going on with the scoop of scapular nerve. But no, I, I like that, you know, that I didn't even think about the position of the scapula. And then I, I like that. <laughs> uh, but uh, continuing forth, uh, you talked a little bit about GERD. And, you, know, you talked a little bit about the hip flexibility when we we're when we we're in our early phases of throwing. Do you think there are any other high points that we should know about kind of this kinetic chain and how and how it could, you know, its, it's role in motion loss? Yeah, no, I think it's great that you mentioned this. I mean, you want to be able to see everything in that kinetic chain. So, you know, more and more is coming out with the motion loss with the with the hips and, and the, you know, correlation with uh, uh, potential injury. So you really want to want to watch that. So you want to see where, where are people at with with regards to flexibility of their hips. But you also want to make sure, you know, hamstrings, you know, you don't want to be too tight there. So you want to check. Uh, your hamstrings. I think that it's really super important to perform a step down test. I think that that's absolutely critical. Um, What you're going to get with that is the ability to look, you know, how, how does somebody control their, their, their body basically on one, one leg, if they're falling down and they're falling into a valgus position you know that the hip external rotators are weak, their core uh, abdomen's weak, their VMO is probably weak. Um, so, you know, most throwers that I see have some, even high level will have elements of this. And again, these are some of the most important aspects of the kinetic chain. And if you're having trouble that far down, you know that everything downstream uh, you're not maximizing what you potentially could do. And quite frankly, you're probably putting yourself at a little bit of risk. Mm, okay. That makes sense. And and so Dr. Uh, Freehill, when you see these patients in your office, what is your, you know, what are what are the things that you're asking them? You know, so what are you what are you asking them on history? And then we can transition to what physical exam tests you're doing for them. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's important to get, you know, the thorough story here, you know, with the, you know, are they, are they only playing baseball? What other sports do they play? Unfortunately, now, you know, we're in this time where earlier and earlier uh, individuals are feeling that they have to get into, a, you know, sport specificity or a one sport specialist type of deal, you know, which is defined as, playing one sport greater than eight months per year, you know, at the expense of playing any, any other sports. And I think that doing that really early, uh, well, we know that, that that's risky and puts yourself in, in harm's way with regards to potential injury. And again, it's getting back to the particular sport, especially if you're a pitcher, you know, it just, it cannot handle that. So the history with regards to how many teams are you playing for? How many months of the year are you playing for? When's the last time you shut down your arm for three months without throwing? Um, What other positions do you play besides pitcher? We know from the literature that pitcher and catcher in combination puts you at higher risk because of the sheer number of throws that you'll make. Um, If they're a pitcher, you know, what, what types of pitches do they throw depending on the age? Um, you know, are they throwing breaking balls, uh, meaning sliders or curveballs? And if so, how are they throwing those? Um, and that that's, you know, we could go out on wild tangents, <laughs> podcast alone on that topic. But, you know, and then uh, I like what you just said, you know, when, when, where is the timing? And that gets back into your phases of throwing. 
you know, you can, if they can tell you where that's occurring, you know, in what phase, is it when you're late cocking and your, your arm's about to go forward or is it, or is it when you release the ball, you know, that just getting that type of granular information can really help you focus in on exactly what the problem is. And then, you know, yeah, you look for mechanical symptoms and, and, the, and the things you've mentioned, but basically the story they tell you can really uh, start to take you down the right lane. And that being said, you know, what, what are you doing when you examine them? You know, so you talked a little bit earlier about the step down test for the kinetic chain. Uh, and you said, you know, their body, the position of their body, if they're in valgus and if they're, you know, if they're not able to hold their, um, their self up doing that, that may clue you in towards, they may have an issue with their kinetic chain that may need to be addressed. But what, what are some other physical exam things that you are, are doing when you're, you know, looking at their shoulder and just examining these patients? Yeah, I mean, I think the, fir the first thing I do, I usually, uh, you know, I'll, I do both of these with throwers. But what I'll usually start with is uh, you have to take the shirt off. You have to be able to see uh, their back. You have to be able to see all the musculature. There's lots of different diagnoses that are important to be able to uh, determine based on that. And I'll have them do repeated forward flexion to start to look for abnormal scapular thoracic motion uh, or dyskinesis, if you will. And then if they do start to fatigue or have some discomfort, I will put my hand there like that and calling scapular assist and ask them if it feels better or if they feel stronger firing their arm forward. So that this is the first thing that I do. Then I look for range of motion of the neck coracoid tenders to palpation or not. And then I get into my motion around the shoulder and I will do all of the, you know, forward flexion, external rotation with the arm at the side, abduction, internal rotation up the posterior thorax. But then, you know, the important thing with throwers, again, 90 degrees of abduction, external rotation and internal rotation. Critical. Uh, yeah, cuff strain, of course, I, I'll do that. I like to do my jobs with a dynamometer to get some kind of objective numbers in uh, external rotation with the arm at the side. And then I, I'll also get resistance uh, in external rotation um, with the arm at 90 degrees, just to get an idea of that, you know, kind of lower posterior uh, rotator cuff. Okay. Status. And then a lot of your superior labrum tests. Again, you're going to go down different avenues. You know, if a kid dives for a ball and dislocates his shoulder or thinks, he, you know, you're, you're going to probably work in some other tests. Uh, or, you know, if he swings and misses at, at a pitch uh, and his uh, lead, lead shoulder is hurting, uh, which might be his non-throwing shoulder, you know, again, you're, I mean, you're in the back of your mind, you're thinking, okay, this mechanism is kind of consistent with the posterior labrum uh, lesion, and, and I need to mix in a lot of, you know, some specific tests for that as well. So, you know, depending on where you're going with this, you want to see it all. Okay. And just to, again, summarize, you said, you know, you, you're, you're expecting them, you're taking a look to see if there's any atrophy or anything. Uh, of that sort, if there's any bruises or anything going on, you can look also look at the position of the scapula, see if you see a prominent medial border or not. You can have them, uh, you can have them forward flex and just watch their scapula thoracic motion. If that seems to be off, you may do a scapular assistance test where you put your hand on the back of the scapula and see if that um, helps them or they can do that any bit easier. You check their range of motion. Very importantly. When their shoulders are abducted, you check their internal and external rotation, kind of checking that total arc. And then after that, you know, it's kind of what they're complaining about or, or what their story is. Again, you just made a great example of they have an issue after missing a, a bat, something that kind of or missing a hit. Um, that's something that kind of leads you more towards you may want to do your posterior labrum test to make sure something nothing's going on with that. And then also you, we mentioned the kinetic chain a little bit earlier. Now, what just moving forward, what imaging do you get? Do you get imaging? Do you get x-rays on everybody? Do you get MRIs or MRAs with their arm in the abducted external rotation position? Now, all these different things are something that I've seen out there. But what, what do you typically do? Well, I, you know, I, I'll get, I always will get x-rays. And okay. if it's a young thrower, 
and their physes are still open, uh, I will usually get contralateral films uh, to, to, to compare. Um, you know, I'm not going to get an MRI or an MRA right out of the chute. Um, I think now if you, you know, if, if something's been going on long enough and, you know, they're not having success uh, with the non-operative management and they've done appropriate rehab and they're better balanced and everything's there. Um, I think that now uh, at, you know, at least at certain places, certainly here, you know, I, I can usually get away with a regular MR um, and see what I need to. I don't think that an MR arthrogram is a bad idea. It's just if, if, uh, if you're get, you have to understand what you're getting it for. If, if somebody's shut down and they can't throw, uh, then an MR arthrogram is a great idea, especially if you're thinking labral pathology. The other thing I, I think is a nice addition to the uh, arthrogram is adding a little bit of rapivacaine, uh, you know, to or and even steroid uh, to the contrast dye, because that way, you know, you're getting the dye and that's helping to seep around your soft tissues for potential better diagnostics, but you're also, by putting in that, that rapivacaine and putting in a little bit of steroid, you could be treating it and certainly helping with your diagnosis. Because if you do that and they say they had zero relief and their arm still hurt, then, then you're probably looking at an extra articular source of, of what's driving the discomfort. So I, I think that's a nice mm -hmm trick and I and I will use that but I, I I won't get an arthrogram on somebody if they're still actively playing for the most part they're because that's going to sit that's going to knock them out for probably five days okay but if it's somebody that just you know they can't play because they're having such difficulty uh then obviously you're not losing anything by getting that and that allows you the opportunity to to add the injection to help further increase your ability to diagnose yeah i actually didn't even know that the arthrogram would knock them out for you know four or five days that's, that's something new i'm learning here too along with many other things that i've learned on this podcast so far um and okay well you mentioned a little bit earlier about about patients coming through and, and doing a rehab um etc uh what is your typical first line treatment for you know these patients the the, the you know, the pitcher comes in shoulder pain, you've examined them and it may be due to a couple other things. What are, what are some of your non-op treatments depending on what you think the overall uh, uh, pathology or thing that may be going on with that patient in their shoulder is? Yeah. I mean, you've listed them very well here and, and you have the, the guy doing the sleeper stretch right there. I, you know, I think that that's really effective and that's something that's going to be utilized by everybody stretching that posterior capsule. You can add the adduction or cross-body adduction to help stretch the posterior capsule as well. And just what you showed with the kinetic chain, I mean, they're going to hammer everything, hip external rotators, VMOs, abs, um, working all the way up. And then the scapular dyskinesis, just like you have there, you really want to hammer all those scapular stabilizers, uh, lots of rows, lots of pinching, really rebalancing. And then, and then your shoulder girdle strengthening. You know, it's very interesting. A lot of times they will have uh, relatively strong rotator cuffs. Uh, not always if you have something else going on, but a lot of times if a, a lot of these other aspects are not quite balanced appropriately, it's amazing how their rotator cuff can be normal, but yet that's what they've been doing with physical therapy, but not doing any of the other stuff, which is probably what's really causing the, the problem. Mm, and, and how long you know, so how long of a, how long do you do this treatment for? You know, do you, do you send them for four to six weeks that are not getting better, come back and you think of something else or do this need, do they need to be have prolonged therapy? You know, what is your, what's your talk or your discussion with them like? And then, you know, after that, we can talk about the operative things. So what is your, what's your discussion with them like? Or you say, Hey, it may take you a year to get back. This may take you six months. What do you, what do you say? Well, you know, it's a tricky question. I think that I don't think you can put everybody in the same bag. I mean, you really okay. have to look at how long have symptoms been going? How much trouble are they having? 
Uh, if it's just a little tweak here and there and they're worried and, you know, I, I think you can shut down for a couple of weeks and get them with the right therapist and start to build them up as you start to get them going back into throwing. If it's, uh, you know, a true, a true problem where they've been unable to throw for months and every time they throw out pain, et cetera, then that's usually a shut, shutting down from throwing uh, for up to three months. And then, and then really emphasizing the therapy and, uh, and then going back on a throwing program. Okay. And, I would say the sweet spot is probably six weeks. Okay. Okay. Perfect. That makes sense. And so, you know, that's our non-op treatment. So what is, you know, what is our operative treatment for the, the thrower's shoulder? What are some of our different treatment options? As far as operative goes? Uh, yes, sir. Well, you know, I mean, the first thing is the conversation and, and I, tell people this as a surgeon is, you know, you don't want to be doing a lot of shoulder surgeries on, on throwers. And if you are, you're, you're probably not completely understanding uh, what all's going on and what's at stake because I, having gone through this, I just, it's, it's very unpredictable how they're going to do. Uh, after you stick that scope in. And it's interesting that I talk to others who have had surgeries and I'm not so sure that part of it, it isn't that what, what, you, what you've done or what a surgeon's done has gone in, has been a reasonable plan and they've executed it perfectly. Uh, but I think that there's something about the proprioception around the shoulder, which is different than almost any other sport and any other joint of a lifetime of throwing a ball and just all the synchronicity that goes into that. And that just putting the scope in even, just doing any kind of surgery, I just think might, it's hard to predict how that's altering the proprioception, this like perfect synchronicity that you've built for years and years and years. And again, there might not be a lot of science behind that, but to me, it makes sense. Right. So okay. um, if I am going to do a surgery, I mean, it, this can come in different forms, but <laughs> obviously um, I will, as you're showing kind of releasing thickened posterior capsule, I will do that. Um, it's not often, but I will. Uh, you do have slap tears and slap, slap pathology is very common. Again, I think that you can do all the non-operative management that we've already discussed, but occasionally you'll have somebody that's recalcitrant and just cannot get over the hump. I, um, I will do that surgery. I think that I've been fortunate enough to be, have good, very good training and have great mentors and, and be around a lot of the leaders uh, around, around pro, professional baseball uh, who have become great mentors of mine. And I think some of their techniques are, are really, really good. Um, and you're not just putting a heavy number two suture around a superior labrum and smashing it into the glenoid. And, you know, I think that when you look in the literature about um, the failure rates of slap repairs, and Mike Sicotti and the, the group out of Jefferson or Rothman, uh, you know, 63% uh, return. I mean, that's a big deal, right? If you're someone sitting in your office and you're talking about their likelihood of returning to the same level uh, and it's, it's only just over 60%, that's a big deal. Uh, so um, when we looked at it and just published this in, in the past year, the, the superior label uh, outcomes based on different techniques uh, that have been recorded. First of all, it's amazing how often uh, some of the outcome studies for slap tears in baseball players didn't really dive into the technique much. Right. Uh, and the techniques are all over the map. So I'm not so sure uh, that there's not a superior way to do the superior label repairs, which allow it to be more anatomic, if you will, and get them back a little bit more to where they live versus just getting the labrum down. 
Um, so I kind of went on a tangent there, but no, it's perfect. It's important. And, and so that's regarding, you know, kind of labor repairs. You talked about um, doing a capsule release, you know, for these patients that may have kind of like GERD or, you know, that have that posterior capsule tightness. Anything you do with the rotator cuff tear, and I think in my reading, I, I found some, it was some co- somewhat controversial as far as exactly how to manage partial and full thickness tears. Um, but anything, you know, in, from your experience of how you manage, you know, these rotator cuff tears and these throwers. Well, yeah, it's a, it's again, it's a, it's an, it's a, it's a great question and you're going to see it. And, and, you know, the big question is do, what do you have to do? And, uh, I, you know, if you have a big full thickness tear, you know, the standard rotator cuff repairs and throwers, it's not that common. They don't do that well. Um, if you get into the partial articular sided tears, you know, the question becomes, do you just debride? Um, and you, you have on there greater than 50% you repair, you know, I, you know, in me personally, and again, there's, there's, I'm not nearly as experienced as a, as a, as a lot in this space with the elite level throwers and and with regards to the numbers of, of cuffs, but I will tell you that I do everything possible not to, uh, perform a repair. Okay. All right, cool. Well, uh, Dr. Freer, I think this has been a great podcast. I know I learned a bunch, uh, uh, learned a lot about the thorough shoulder. We talked about, um, we talked about the history or kind of the epidemiology a little bit about thorough shoulder. We talked uh, a lot about the pathophysiology and, and kind of the thought process behind the thrower shoulder and and the different um, the different changes that occur in the thrower shoulder. Uh, we talked about things to ask patients or, or inquire about it from the history, physical exam. We talked about some imaging. We also talked about non-operative treatment, sleeper stress and therapy. And we talked a little bit about operative treatment as well. Uh, before we wrap up here, is there anything else that you think you know our listeners should get regarding the thrower's shoulder? No, I, I, I think uh, we covered a lot of ground. Hopefully uh, the listeners will enjoy this and, you know, I'm always free to to uh, answer questions and you know every time we talk about this we all learn from each other so i appreciate you having me oh yes sir again dr freehill is uh such a pleasure to have you on again thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to come on and, and talk on the podcast uh, we hope those that are listening go and leave a review and let us know how much they love learning about the uh, the thrower's shoulder and uh, again dr freehill thanks so much for coming on the podcast all right T- take care thanks everybody <laughs>